Today I'm talking about a Supreme Court case where you'd need to change surprisingly few words to make it read like a newspaper article today. Stop me if this sounds familiar, but in 1960, the New York Times published a story that was critical of a politician. The politician got really angry about it, declared that there were a few small inaccuracies, and sued the newspaper for libel. Now if you can't see how this is relevant to today's political climate, well then I envy you. Basically, fake news, lawsuits and banning against Alex Jones, and news reports about Trump wanting to change the libel laws with regards to Woodward's new book, I think now might be a pretty important time to open up our massive Supreme Court decision catalog and see just what these libel laws are, so that we can protect Trump from unwarranted insults by this idiot Woodward who wrote this book, which is all fiction. All right, let's get a little background on this case. It was early 1960, and Martin Luther King Jr. had just become the first person in Alabama history to be criminally charged for tax fraud. Well, I thought that was going a different direction. Great, he was already making history. So this is where the New York Times comes in, because they published an ad for donations to defend MLK on those perjury charges. And what's the best way to raise funds? False pretenses. The advertisement detailed a quote, wave of terror, unquote, perpetrated by civil rights opponents. Amongst other horrors, the advertisement accused the Alabama Police Department of terrorizing student protesters. In particular, the advertisement claimed police had padlocked the students' dining hall, quote, in an attempt to starve them into submission, unquote. The problem was that the advertisement contained a number of factual inaccuracies. The Alabama police never padlocked the student dining hall, and several other statements in the advertisement were either false or exaggerated. Yeah, it was Alabama in the early 1960s, so there weren't really any good examples of police abusing minorities that you could find without making things up. There were quite a few small inaccuracies peppered into this article to make things seem worse than they actually were which led Alabama Public Safety Commissioner L.B. Sullivan to sue the New York Times for libel in Alabama court. The state court awarded him $500,000, and the state Supreme Court affirmed that opinion. Which leads us to today, and the highest court of the land. New York Times Company Petitioner versus L.B. Sullivan. Right off the bat, and this was a little bit of an obstacle in doing this case, the justices just didn't use their mics. Not sure why, but the sound quality was terrible. I kid you not, I did a search for the word inaudible and it came up 153 times in this case. It sounded like the parent from Peanuts was moderating this debate. Yes ma'am, we were playing hangman. Studying? Oh yes ma'am. Still though, with the help of the attorneys who spoke pretty clearly, as well as looking at the transcript, I can work around this and still get to the meaning of what was going on. The first major issue with this libel precedent setting case is that it isn't really about libel. Well, it is, but it wasn't really initiated because anyone was offended by something the New York Times says. And when you listen to it, it's clear that something is missing, because the newspaper is making some really weird choices. Take for example the whole basis of this lawsuit. According to Alabama statutes, if you rescind the article, you can't be held liable for libel. Alabama and Virginia were two of the earliest states which enacted these retraction statutes and that a, that a defendant in Alabama can eliminate entirely special and general damages, as I've described them, by retraction. The Times we submit has done this in the governor's case. It refused to do it in our case. Yeah, the Times issued a retraction on this article for the governor. But this isn't the governor who's suing, it's the city's public safety commissioner, Sullivan, who wanted the same retraction again, except for him. Well, that's weird, but okay. Maybe you wanted your name on the retraction. Turns out you got your name on an entire Supreme Court case, so congratulations. This brings us to the question that was dogging me the entire time I was listening to this. Why would the New York Times retract the article for the governor, but not for the commissioner? I mean, was there some grudge between the New York Times and L.B. Sullivan? All of this only made sense when I listened to a second Supreme Court case that happened the next day that didn't set precedent, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. 
But as I learned the hard way, the first case makes zero sense without it. The courts of Alabama have decreed that these four individual petitioners, too, should be punished in a civil libel action. All right, so who are those four people who don't represent the times, and why are they being punished? What did, what did these petitioners do to deserve this punishment? A precise recital of the evidence brings into sharp focus how the petitioners' constitutional rights have been violated. The petitioners are not, in truth, being punished for what they did or failed to do in this case, for what they said and did elsewhere, and who they are. The, the central fact of this case is that they are being dra drastically punished because they were Negroes residing in Alabama who've had the courage to speak out in the struggle to, to achieve the rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Well, this took an unexpected turn. Yeah, it turns out that this whole thing was just a plan to punish four African American activists that got way out of hand. While the state's governor sent his complaint to the New York Times, Sullivan sent his complaint somewhere else. Remember how this was an ad, not an article. Well, Sullivan wrote his complaint to the people who took out the ad. And this is where things just get stupid, because... Mr. John Murray, who was a volunteer worker for the committee to defend Martin Luther King in the struggle for freedom in the South, testified that on or about March 25, 1960, he took the draft of the advertisement in question to the New York Times and gave it to a Mr. Aronson, who was an employee of the paper. Mr. Murray testified that in addition to the proposed advertisement with the names of a large group of individuals and a letter from A. Philip Randolph saying that those persons were signed members of the committee and endorsed the advertisement. All right, nothing too weird yet, but wait for it. Mr. Murray and Mr. Aronson who were the two people who would know, both testified at the trial, and each testified that the names of these four petitioners were not on the list. Mr. Murray further testified that the executive director of the committee, Mr. Rustin, sometime later, after the original advertisement had been submitted to the paper, decided that he wanted some prominent names from the South to be included among the sponsors. So he proceeded to add to the original list submitted to the New York Times some names from a list he had in his desk of persons who belonged to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So this guy just added a bunch of prominent civil rights leaders' names as sponsors for this advertisement. Because, well, you're a lot more likely to get your lies published if Martin Luther King's name is on the contributing authors list. To hammer this point home... Now because he was anxious to get the advertisement published, he decided not to take the time to ask the individuals for permission to use their names. All of the petitioners testified. Each is a spiritual and religious leader of his people. All have been active in the cause of civil rights. Each testified, though, that he had not been and was not a member of the Committee to Defend Martin Luther King. None authorized publication of the advertisement that appeared in the New York Times or had any knowledge of the advertisement prior to its publication. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't ask for permission because he was too busy. That sounds about right. So anyways, this guy Sullivan sent letters to four prominent black civil rights leaders asking them to take down this ad they didn't know existed and then sued them for libel when they didn't respond. Call me naive, but when I started this episode, I thought I was going to end up with an innocent case on libel law precedent. Although in hindsight, when you hear Martin Luther King, Alabama in 1960, your first thought probably isn't, hey, isn't that the time when the New York Times is being sued for publishing false details? And if that was your first thought, well then wow, they really cut down on how much they cover the civil rights movement in public schools. All right. So with that context, let's get back to the thick of the story I actually set out to talk about, libel laws. Because despite some pretty strong racial undertones, on paper this case was about a judgment of the Supreme Court of Alabama, which in our submission poses hazards for the freedom of the press, uh, not confronted since the early days of the Republic.
There were varying degrees of misrepresentation in these articles, with the most egregious being reporting seven people got arrested by the police when it was only four, and reporting that police had locked protesters in a cafeteria when they hadn't. Now don't get me wrong, this is a sign of terrible quality control on advertising on the part of the New York Times. But in this context of all the terrible things in this article, this lawsuit is like saying, hey, your article said I stabbed him 10 times, it was only 8, check your sources. The other problem was a section of this article that over relied on pronouns. It said southern violators have answered Dr. King's peaceful protests with intimidation and violence. They have bombed his home, almost killing his wife and child. They have assaulted his person. They have arrested him several times for speeding, loitering, and similar offenses. This led to police saying, Hey, because clearly we were the only ones who could have unfairly arrested him, the fact that they both have the same they makes it look like we were the ones who had bombed MOK's house too. Yeah, a third of this case read like an SJW watching a stand up comedy performance. You're just looking for ways to get offended. Also, if as your argument repeatedly said, It's our contention that a, an ordinary reader of, of normal intelligence knows that the people who arrest for loitering and speeding are the municipal police. There is no attempt made in this paragraph to differentiate in any manner the they who arrested for loitering and speeding from the they who bombed and the they who assaulted and the they who indicted for murder. If a reasonable reader of intelligence thinks it's plausible police are going around bombing prominent civil rights leaders' houses, well then you have a bigger image problem to take care of. So this led to a few questions. First, does the city commissioner even have claim to be offended by this? There were incorrect statements made, but they were all about state police, so the commissioner suing for libel would be like me suing for libel because someone made an incorrect and insulting statement about my dad's coworker. Now, I do want to say this, as far as a padlocking statement is concerned, I submit that from the context, and this is a real grievance about this paragraph, incidentally, the padlocking. Uh, I submit that that grievance has just absolutely nothing to do with a respondent. It's, if anybody has a grievance about it, it's the state authorities that are the referred to in those words. This is where things got weird though, because the people fighting against this libel action made a statement that, well, it really took the wind out of my sails. It was meant to show this libel law's logic taken to the most extreme, but... I can't... Uh, say that the New York police uh, tap wires, for example, uh, though I believe they do, uh, without giving Commissioner Murphy an action against me, since it's illegal uh, for them to do it without a court order in New York and under the federal law. Uh, and I've got to prove, I've got to prove truth and make my defense by proving truth. If this doctrine is constitutional. Okay, yeah, that does not sound like a dystopian world where a newspaper reporter has to prove with real evidence what they're saying is true. The problem here is that, in issuing a retraction for the governor, the Times admitted that what they said was untrue, so they couldn't claim truth in this case. So the best they could argue is, well, at the time we had nothing to back up our reporting, which is exactly what they did. They Exact facts, uh, Mr. Justice, are that at the time when the publication was made, the New York Times had nothing by way of information to indicate that the statements were false. So what they're arguing is that if at the time of publishing you can't definitively prove something is not untrue, you can report it. Which, wow, alright, newfound respect for Infowars. I'm sure at the time of publishing, he had no definitive evidence that the CIA wasn't putting chemicals in the water to turn the freaking frogs gay. If this is where journalistic integrity is at, well, I might start citing the National Enquirer more in my reports with these real headlines. 
Justice Scalia murdered by hooker, and Hillary Clinton lesbian lover's name in secret email, and candidate Trump pays hush money to point- oh wait no they didn't get around to publishing that one, just bought the rights to use it. Anyways, yeah, truth could fall apart pretty fast with this logic. Although this wasn't really expanded upon. Instead, they listed off some other reasons why this might not be libelous. A major reason was that it comes to Mr. Justice. The issue is, I think, whether a state may constitutionally, for the sake of protecting individual repute, uh, sorry, for the sake of protecting official reputation. We're not dealing with individual reputation here. We're dealing with official reputation. It's criticism of his official conduct that's involved, not private, not his private life. Yes, these false accusations were targeting him as a politician and not as a person. Now that doesn't mean much on its own, but when you factor in writings by James Madison about the purpose of the First Amendment, the freedom of speech and freedom of the press one, things start falling together. The First Amendment was precisely designed to do away with seditious libel. This coupled with the precedent from the earlier case of NAACP v Button which said that erroneous statement is inevitable in free debates and that it must be protected if the freedom of expression is to have the breathing space they need to survive. And you have a pretty good argument on your hand. So who won and why? Well, the court ruled unanimously in support of the New York Times and issued the following precedent setting statements in their decision. When a statement concerns a public figure, it's not enough to show that it is false for the press to be liable for libel. Instead, the target of the statement must show that it was made with the knowledge or reckless disregard for its falsity. Furthermore, for the vast majority of you who, like me, aren't public figures and are still get angry about the press lying about you, the First Amendment requires that the plaintiff show that the defendant knew that a statement was false or was reckless in deciding to publish the information without investigating it further. So there you are. Thank you racists for helping us determine our libel laws. Until next time, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you want to support independent journalism investigating the Supreme Court, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking this floating logo to the right of my head for weekly Supreme Court Saturday episodes. Remember to subscribe and let freedom ring by clicking that bell. Leave your comment if you have an important case you think I should research. And as always, thank you for watching.